Hey, I'm Felissa Rose, and you're watching Keto and Crime. What you're looking at is footage of the 1972 interview that the great Johnny Carson did with Madeline Murray O'Hare. She was the founder of the longest standing and most national, largest atheist organization in the country, American Atheists. Her disappearance and murder that took place several years ago has been the subject of many controversies, much speculation, as well as, as well as the subject of many inquisitions into possible financial discrepancies in American atheists, which were never proven, which were never proven. But Madeline was controversial from the start, both in her youth before American atheists, and is responsible for the lawsuit that basically took school sanctioned school prayer out of American public schools. She was a longtime fighter for separation of church and state, quite the controversial figure making the rounds on many television talk shows, including being included on Bill Donahue's inaugural show, where she argued with a famous televangelist of the day. So Madeline was definitely one of the most controversial in, uh, figures in American history and earned her name, her moniker, as the most hated woman in America. And with that, we're going to dive into a keto and crime classic, The Case of the Most Hated Woman in America. Let's dive in. Hey everyone, welcome to Thought Crime and Keto and Crime. Today, or actually late tonight, we've got a very, very special episode for you. This is a case that's near and dear to my heart. We're going to talk about the life and murder of the most hated woman in America, Madeline Marie O'Hare. She was the creator of American Atheist. She was the woman that filed the suit that helped get administratively led school prayer and Bible reading, religious reading, out of public schools. Um, so let's just say she made some waves in the 40s, 50s, and 60s here in the United States and was eventually, I think, one of the reasons that her murder went unsolved for so long. So into Madeline. Madeline was born April 13th, 1919 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to working class family John and Lee Lena Mays. She had an older twin brother known as John Irwin Jr. and uh, basically grew up for a few years in Pittsburgh, but eventually moving the family was moved to Ohio, where in 1936, uh, Madeline graduated from Rossford High School in Rossford, Ohio. Not long after graduating from high school in 1941, she met and married John Henry Roth, who was a steel worker and the Two both enlisted in the U.S. military at the beginning of World War II. Uh, John entered the Marine Corps and Madeline entered the WAX, Women's Army Corps, where she was assigned to the cryptography unit and was stationed in Europe. During her time in Italy, she met William J. Murray, Jr., a naval officer who was also an ardent Roman Catholic, and the two began a crazy extramarital affair which culminated in Madeline becoming pregnant with his son. However, due to him being Catholic, and I say that because of like religious, he wouldn't divorce his wife. So Madeline was left to raise the child on her own with no support from Murray. And she basically returned to the United States where she did change her last name to Murray. She wasn't going to be outdone. She was just that type of girl. And uh, gave birth to William J. Murray III, shortly after her return in 1945. As I said, Madeline was a woman beyond her time. She was a ardent feminist. She was an outspoken atheist. She was an activist. And she also was not 
shy about saying that she uh, she likes men and women, so she was definitely a bisexual before I think that was even a term. So as you can imagine she took 1940s Ohio by storm. They loved her there. Not really. Uh, but while while there, she did manage to complete a bachelor's degree in Ashland from Ashland University and eventually earned a law degree from South Texas College of Law, but did not pass the bar exam in any state that we know of. Her experience with the, the, with the father of her child, uh, William Murray Jr., led her to have even a bigger disdain for religion. Now, I'm not saying this is what led her to eventually start an atheist organization. What I am saying that that coupled with being raised as a strict Presbyterian as a child led her to see religion as no more than a bunch of rules that one has to follow. And that, that kind of thinking would stick with her for the rest of her life. But uh, being that Ohio, especially after she divorced her husband, wasn't very friendly uh, to a, a single mom, or a very idealistic single mom. She moved to with Bill to Baltimore, Maryland in 1954. There she got involved with another man by the name of Michael Fiorelli, but he ended up giving birth to his son, John Garth Murray, in 1954. However, they broke up before John Garth was born, and I don't think John Garth, her youngest son, ever had any contact with his father. So here she is now, a single mother of two. She got both. She was living here with her mom and her twin brother in a house in Baltimore, and she also got involved in the Civil Rights Movement, which was really heating up around this time in all of the southern region, whether it's a southern state or not, in the entire region. She would take the boys to protests outside businesses that would not serve African Americans and uh, basically kind of got snubbed by her entire neighborhood. There were lots of rocks and bricks thrown through the Murray uh, window. There were the Both boys were bullied at school as a result of their activities, but they stayed strong. And it was in 1960 that supposedly, after getting sucked into the works of Anne Ran and other people that Madeline attempted to supposedly advocate to the Soviet Union from Paris in 1960 with both her boys, but it is said the Soviet Union turned her down because to them they didn't want a single mother with two children. However, that was never proven, and I think a lot of that has to do with rumor and the fact that you have an atheist a feminist, uh, a non-straight person, single mom, and all that goes together with commie. Because during the during this period, we're right in the middle of McCarthyism. You have people being accused of communism left and right, actually, you know, tried for it. So I think all of that feeds in. I don't think that actually happened. It could have, I suppose, but as of right now, it's an unsubstantiated rumor. She returned with her children to Baltimore, and in... The early 1960s, uh, upon her older son, William Murray, telling her that he was forced to recite the Lord's Prayer and read Bible passages in the morning, she filed a lawsuit against Baltimore Public Schools. The case of Murray versus Curtail actually ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court in 1963, where she challenged the notion that the school forcing a particular type of prayer on children was unconstitutional. It was against the Establishment Clause. It was against the First Amendment, which is interpreted as being a strict divide between religion and the state. It, with another case that was filed around the same time, was lumped together under the case Abington School District versus Shemp and went all the way to the Supreme Court where it was ruled unconstitutional to force children to pray in school. Another suit. Engel versus Vital from New York was also ruled on that uh, within that same year as well, and it also kind of took on forced Bible reading. So you had three lawsuits. Madeline's combined with one out of New York form school district versus Shemp in 1963, and then you had Engel versus Vital out of New York. All of these basically had either administratively led religious reading or administratively led prayer outlawed in public schools. Now, can students still pray in school? Absolutely. Can teachers still pray in school? Absolutely, as long as you don't force anyone else to do it or 
It is voluntarily student-led. Students can have religious organ clubs, religious organizations. They can do anything they want to do as long as it's student-led. You just can't have the school forcing a particular type of prayer. And that was Madeline's issue with this. It was uniquely Judeo-Christian Protestant prayer that she said was being used in school. And that could be offensive to A, people that aren't religious and they don't want their children exposed to anything. Catholics, because it wasn't you know Catholic prayer. Muslims, because it was a Christian prayer, so on and so forth. Now, if you are one of the majority Christians that live in this country, that, you probably didn't think anything of it. But Protestant Christians in this country, you probably didn't think anything of it. If you're an atheist like me, or if you're a Muslim, or a Hindu, or a Buddhist, or a Catholic, or, or a Jewish person, you probably don't want your children forced to do that, and that's the reason. And that's the reason we also have private religious schools that teach your particular religion that you can send your children to. So, But she really believed in the separation of church and state, and that's what she fought for here, and she won it. But of course, this did not make her very popular with very religious America, very religious Maryland at the time. And the attacks on her home, the attacks on her person, death threats, started amplifying after this ruling, as you can imagine. So she decided it was time to take the family to Greener. And in 1963, after a brief stint in Hawaii, those greener pastures were Austin. She founded American Atheists in Austin, Texas in 1963 out of a very small house, the first nonprofit strictly for the advancement of the separation of church and state. It's not exclusively for atheists, even though the name intends that. It's for anybody that wants to keep church church out of government and government out of church. It's the converse there, too, as well. But it does tend to be highly popu you know, populated with people that are considered non-believers. Also in 1965, she met mar and married her second husband, Richard O'Hare, who was a former U.S. Marine, and yes, had been a member of a communist group in Pittsburgh, although I think maybe that had to do more with mutual interests between he and Madeline than it really fueling her beliefs for American atheists, but still, it's a fact. The two had a very tumultuous marriage and ended up separating later to remain married until their deaths. While in Austin, Susan, who was William Murray, the, the oldest child of Madeline Murray that she filed that lawsuit on behalf of, became pregnant with William's son. They gave birth to Robin Murray O'Hare. Uh, the young marriage didn't do so well with the child, uh, so the two split up. Uh, the Murrays did retain custody of young Robin, but it drove young Bill to drinking. He was run, helping his mother to run American Atheist, but the stress of the divorce and custody battle for his daughter got to young Bill, and he began drinking and ended up joining Alcoholics Anonymous to, to overcome his, his vice there. But, uh, of course, Alcoholics Anonymous is one of the 12-step programs that kind of make you give yourself over to a higher power, even if that higher power is a doorknob. Um, but, of course, it's Judeo-Christian based, and that, coupled with a nightmare he had about judgment and hell, led Bill to become an evangelical Christian around that same time. He also went on a tour with the uh, several evangelical churches talking about how his mother had forced him into atheism and kind of made a career out of it, culminating in the creation of a nonprofit dedicated to putting prayer back in schools. Talk about irony. Uh, Madeline always referred to Bill after that as a post birth abortion, so she did not take that well. However, her younger son, John Garth, remained with her, remained in the hierarchy of American atheists, and young Robin also remained with her grandmother, eventually, Madeline adopting her as her own daughter. And the three of them lived together in Austin, Texas. In 1967, Madeline made history by, by appearing on the very young Bill Donahue show. In fact, she was the very first guest on the pilot episode. The Bill Donahue show, though a legendary talk show now, was just starting then. It was filmed out of a small studio in Dayton, Ohio. And let's just say Madeline's appearance on that, where she literally said, God's not real, taunted Christians that called in to argue with her, made Donahue an instant success. And over the years, 
Phil would have Madeline on many, many times. Because what America will do is kick Christianity out and uh, all of you preachers... The ones that I'm talking about waking up are the ones that would love the Lord and not kick him out because the crowd I'm talking to about waking up are the ones who should love the Lord and claim to do, but they kind of been in an why should condition. I, why should I love the Lord? Why should anybody else love the Lord? What has oh, the I Lord ever done for any of us? First, I don't know what he's done for you. I, now, I'm talking, when I like, say us, I mean to, I'm talking I can in tell individually humanity. what he's done for me because he's changed my life. He's given me direction he, in life. He? Why but don't you say she? I'd rather say he because he's the son because, of God. Uh, he's not the daughter of God, see? He's the son of God. See the basis of my faith. Are you talking about somebody specific then when you say I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus oh, Christ. He's precious. He's wonderful. Twelve years ago, you don't, I know what, you don't even know him. You don't know what you're talking about. Because she was a ratings darling. She would get the ratings even though they were hate watchers. They're still watchers. There are people here on YouTube that sustain channels from hate watching. Same thing. She got the views. And she would continuously appear on Donahue up until about three years before her death. She died in 1995. And she and her entire family would appear on Donahue one last time, three years before their death in 1992. I'm an atheist, and I freely admit that. And that I get ridiculed for saying that. And I wanted to thank her, and I wanted to thank Marlon Brando for having the guts to come up in front of everybody and say this. <laughs> um, uh, Robin, you went to jail. Yes, I was jailed uh, a few years ago because most atheists, when they are in a courtroom situation, of course, they're afraid of how they'll be judged. Uh huh. And you don't they're want to contaminate the jury, so to speak, or they're, right. they're feeling about they're you. They're afraid yes. that if they let the jury know that they dissent to religion, the jury will say, he's yeah, guilty, guilty, or yeah. he's lying, or whatever, but they will not take the testimony at face value. As well as many other talk shows. She was a talk show darling in general. She also started American Atheist Magazine. In addition to American Atheist, she also started a, a small television show, a small public access television show, which ended up getting syndicated out to uh, several public access stations. And she started an atheist free thinker radio program that discussed issues of the day. She also wrote for Playboy and Hustler about things about sexuality, the female orgasm, all sorts of things that were still considered very taboo, even in the loosening up decade of the 60s. And you can see, she probably didn't win her any friends. Not conservative Texas. She would uh, remain president of American Atheists through the late 70s when Bill took over as president for her. Just like Baltimore, she faced arrests. She was arrested for disorderly conduct in Austin in 1977. She... Uh, kind of been, was very polarizing because she spoke about free speech, free love, you know, freedom of religion, any, everything that a conservative Texan necessarily wouldn't want their kids listening to. So she kind of riled them up around Texas. Um, she, in 1984, she actually was a speechwriter for Larry Flint's defunct presidential campaign. Again, she wrote for Hustler. And finally, in the 80s, she stepped down as president of American Atheists with her son, John Gar, succeeding her. It was also around this same time in the late 80s that she hired a brand new office manager and typesetter for American Atheist magazine named Dave Waters. And Dave Waters was a convicted felon in his teens. He had attacked and killed another teenager. He had also attacked and beaten up his own mother as well as some disorderly conduct while in prison. Madeline overlooked this and decided to give him a chance. He did a great job according to everyone being a typesetter for the magazine, but he then when he was given more responsibility then turned to the dark side as you may, as one may say ended up embezzling $54,000 from the Counts of American Atheists. He was subsequently fired for this he was not investigated by the Austin police because, with given her reputation and the organization she was head of, the Austin police didn't always do things on the up and up when it came to Madeline. So he was never punished for it, and she decided to write a very scathing article about Mr. Waters in American Atheist magazine, and he was heard by many, many people vowing revenge. August 27, 1995, Madeline, Robin, and John Carp were all kidnapped from their Austin home. Breakfast left on the table, coffee still in the coffee pot. They left their dogs there. There was a typewritten note 
found on the door of the Murray residence saying they had been called away on a family emergency and didn't know when they would return. They were taken by three men. They were taken by David Waters and two accomplices, Gary Carr, and Danny Fry, both of who were small-time criminals that had criminal records. The motivation for the kidnapping, it, ransom and extortion and revenge on Madeline. They actually kept them prisoners in local no-tail motels for over a month before the saga ended, and the police did nothing, even though the Officers of American Atheists were begging them to investigate it. They didn't really care. They were more like, it's not a crime to go missing in Texas, and she hasn't been reported missing, so why should we care? That was kind of their attitude toward it, and I think they had a lot to do with who she was. Then you enter a young reporter by the name of, a young reporter by the name of John McCormick at the San Antonio News Express. Actually wrote a series of articles investigating the disappearance of Madeline Murray O'Hare to try, try to spearhead an investigation. Eventually the police did get involved and eventually her older son Bill Murray did file a missing persons and uh, they began to track in late September track the movement of David Waters and his friends. Uh, also around that time John Garth's Mercedes was found to be driven by someone else. That person had John Garth's signature on a bill of sale and on the title. But when shown pictures of John Garth, he did, he denied that was who he bought the car from. That was not who he bought it from. And he was showed pictures of Danny Fry and Danny Fry, Carr, and Waters, and admitted that it was one of them that he bought the car from. Eventually, they tracked them all down to both Texas and states beyond, and eventually got confessions out of Carr and Waters. Danny Fry was nowhere to be found. He had seemed to disappear off the face of the earth. Uh, later on, his mangled torso would wash up on a nearby Texas riverbed. But basically what had happened during the whole saga, they had taken them to hotels, they had maintained a a fairly decent routine with them. They rented movies. They got Madeline her diabetes medicine. They got them all changes of clothes. They rented videos and video games for them. I mean, because they were having them withdraw around $600,000 from both their and American Atheist funds. Now, David Waters had long been spreading the rumor that Madeline kept two sets of books and was embezzling lots of money from American Atheists so that her and her family could make an escape to a different country to avoid all the scrutiny here. That was never proven. There were audits done. It was never proven that Madeline was bezzling anything from American atheists. All the money that was taken was mostly the O'Hare's private money that they gained being high officers for American atheists. It was their own money that they earned. So I want to put that out there right now. But basically, they had them withdraw that money and purchase $500,000 of gold coins from a San Antonio jewelry shop. The jewelry owner, shop owner did collaborate that they did buy this many coins and he thought it was very unusual. This was around September 27th, 1995. Once they had those gold coins, the O'Hares were killed. They were no longer, the O'Murray O'Hares were killed. They were no longer of any value to David Waters and his crew. Uh, according to David Waters' t uh, confession, as well as the state of their remains when they were found, because he did, after confessing, lead them to a desolate Texas field where they were able to dig up the remains of uh, the Murrays and one other person. There, it was partial remains, skulls, hands, a few other bones. All of the skulls, save one, all of the Murrays, had plastic bags wrapped around their face. So that led them to believe they were either st strangled or asphyxiated, even though John Garth Murray did have signs of blunt force trauma on his face. The other set of remains there, a head and hands, ended up through dental records, confirmed to belonging to Danny Fry, who was murdered with a single gunshot wound through the head by Carr and Waters, who said that they didn't feel they could trust him because he drank a lot and they felt he would blab their business all over town. Um, 
Madeline's remains were identified because of a hip replacement she had had several years earlier, and the serial numbers of that hip replacement were traced to being the ones used in her surgery. So, there you have it. Uh, both Carr and Waters were sentenced to two consecutive life sentences, and in a dose of sweet irony and sweet karma, Waters actually died in 2003 of lung cancer. He asphyxiated people, and he suffocated to death himself from lung cancer, so I saw, call that poetic justice. Um, but what happened to the gold coins, you say? Uh, they were stolen from our bungling band of murderers. Uh, they hid them in a storage unit and secured it with a cheap master lock. They were running their mouths in a local uh, diner, and some petty thieves overheard them, went to the storage unit, cut the lock off, took the coins, and had a good time with them. And that's what happened to all that money. Uh, Waters was also, of course, ordered to pay over $500,000 back to Madeline's family, an American atheist, but it never happened. And that's the end of the legacy of the most hated woman in America. Uh, for all she did for the separation of church and state, I would like to have seen her be able to live out her years in peace, but uh, just wasn't to be, I suppose. Uh, she's a very important person uh, to my own personal history because I said I am an atheist. I'm a member of American Atheists. I have many atheist friends. And uh, she really was a freedom fighter. She was a fighter to keep your and my rights to believe in a God or not believe in a God. Safe from the tyranny of the government and safe from the tyranny of others. And I can't think of anything more American than that. And uh, that's where I'm going to end. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Keto Comic. Out.